Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Peterson, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the workshop committee um, for giving me the opportunity to um, present um, our research on caffeine intakes from beverages in the United States. This re the research presented here was supported by ILSI North America, and for those of you who are not familiar with IL ILSI, it is a public, non-private foundation that provides a forum to advance the understanding of scientific issues related to the nutritional quality and safety of the food supply. ILSI sponsors research programs, educational seminars, workshops, and publications. The Caffeine work Working Group members are primarily industry scientists with interests in caffeine, safety, and exposure. ILSI has supported research on caffeine since 1983 with several publications, two of which were provided in your packet of information. A special thank you to Allison Kretzer, Director of Science Programs at ILSI, for her help and guidance throughout the research project. Terry Hartman, who was formerly at Penn State, um, as well as Carol Knight and myself, serves as scientific consultants to this project receive funding from ILSI and are co-authors on a manuscript currently under review by the Journal of Food Chemistry and Toxicology, along with John Hockenberry and Robin Toplansky of Kantar World Panel. Kantar World Panel was contracted by the Caffeine Working Group of ILSI, North America, to conduct the beverage consumption survey analysis that I will be presenting here. This study was primarily conducted because of the lack of comprehensive, current, and reliable population-based data on caffeine intakes. We also know that most of the caffeine consumed comes from beverages. And the majority of studies examining exposure to caffeine in the U.S. were, the, were from surveys conducted over a decade ago. The study will also update the previous research sponsored by ILSI and provides an opportunity to compare and contrast the trends in beverage caffeine intakes occurring since our earlier work. The primary objective of our research was to estimate the caffeine intakes in the U.S. population from the consumption of caffeinated beverages. Using a current population-based beverage survey, these data will provide a current perspective on patterns of beverage caffeine exposure in the U.S. from the total population as well as demographic subgroups. I will first discuss the methodology of the Kantar World Panel Beverage Consumption Survey, which provided the detailed data for the development of a targeted database of caffeine values. I will give br a brief description of the analysis, some of the key results, and end with a summary and conclusions. I will also point out some of the differences between the current work and our previous work that were conducted well over 10 years ago. Kantar World Panel is a global consumer panel company focused on the continuous measurement and analysis of consumer behaviors. The continuous annual survey has been conducted for over 30 years and targets U.S. consumers of all ages. The Beverage Consumption <coughs> Panel was the survey used for the analysis that will be presented here today. The respondents were recruited from a pool of about 1 million to obtain approximately 42,000 participants. U.S. Census data was used to guide the selection of the panel to be representative of the U.S. population. Sample selection criteria included age, gender, race, income, geographic region, household size, and presence of children in the household. Invitations were sent to English-speaking panel participants via email and are staggered in batches sent out weekly to ensure a balanced sample across all months of the year. There were no exclusions based on health questions. Beverage data were collected from the beginning of October 2010 through the end of September 2011 as part of the panel of participants or survey respondents age one year and older. And as part of the quality control procedures for the survey, any respondent consuming less than 21 beverages in seven days were excluded from the data set. This is a screenshot of the online beverage survey. Participants are asked to begin completing the survey on a specific day for a total of seven days. The survey requests are rotated throughout the entire week, so individual surveys are started on different days of the week. 
Participants can drag and drop the beverage category into each of the drinking occasion slots on the right. Then they are asked to enter product detail. Details would include the type of beverage, where it was consumed, brand name, and the other descriptive product detail, as well as the amount of beverage consumed. Beverages consumed in and out of the home were also included. In addition, there is a My Info questionnaire that is completed, which contains demographic, lifestyle, attitudes, health, and nutrition questions, as well as height and weight. Weight data has only been collected since 19, 2010, and for this study, weight data in children were only collected for nine months of the 12-month data collection period, or from January 2011 to September 2011. From this detailed beverage diary, we were able to obtain a consolidated beverage list for each of the beverage categories. This allowed for the next step in the research, which was to develop a database. The steps in the database included first identifying which beverage categories contained beverages with caffeine. Information was obtained from manufacturers where possible, but we also used a number of other resources as listed here in no particular order. I think it is important to mention that there is no single resource that was comprehensive enough to capture all of the beverage and beverage types in the survey. Even the large national research databases large national and research databases do not contain brand-specific data for the variety of beverages reported in the survey. In addition, we assigned default values for beverages where there was no data available, insufficient detail provided, or no brand name specified. This illustrates a portion of a summary table that we created from the database with the coffee category as an example and summarizes the range of values for coffee. The default value for coffee was 11.9 milligrams per fluid ounce or the value in a regular brewed caffeinated cup of coffee. The range of values illustrates the variability in caffeine from the various coffee beverage types. Once the database was developed, we could then begin to consolidate caffeine beverages into a more manageable set of categories for the detailed analysis. We also wanted to be consistent with our previous work for the types of beverages that were included in each beverage category, except for one notable difference, which was to include energy drinks and energy shots as separate beverage categories. These were not considered in the previous beverage survey, that was conducted in 1999 since energy drinks were not introduced to the market until 1997. The analysis of total caffeine intakes for all age groups included all of these caffeinated beverage categories. However, since coffee, carbonated soft drinks, tea, and energy drinks contribute approximately 98% or more of the caffeine consumed, we present data on only these four categories. The data analysis included a caffeinated beverage consumer who reported at least one caffeinated beverage in seven days. Parental reports of beverage data for children aged two years and older from the survey were included with two exceptions to control for implausible survey entries associated with parental reporting. Children with body weight data below the third percentile or above the 97th percentile based on weight for age were excluded. CDC growth chart data was used to, as the reference for this, and children with total fluid intakes greater than two standard deviations above the mean fluid intake within a specific age year were also excluded. Another issue was the small sample sizes for some subgroups and some beverage categories. This was a particular concern for several age groups, for energy drinks, and for coffee in the youngest ages of children between the ages of two and five. In these cases, sample size was considered too small to provide reliable estimates, reliable population estimates. I will point these out in the tables. Da descriptive data included caffeine intakes expressed as milligrams per day and as milligrams per kilogram of body weight. In addition, the 90th percentile was calculated. These variables were calculated for total caffeinated beverages and for each beverage category, and for all caffeinated beverage consumers 
and for consumers or users of each of the four beverage categories. All data is expressed as a daily average of the seven days of beverage intake. And now for some results. Of the over 42,000 survey respondents, 37,602 were caffeine consumers, and this represents 85% of the total population who consumed at least one caffeinated beverage over a seven-day period of time. Just for clarification, these proportions in the last column presented by age group are the only data presented for the total U.S. population. For the remainder of the presentation, the data are based on caffeine consumers only. The proportion of the population consuming caffeine ranges from 43% in children 2 to 5 years of age to nearly 100% of adults over the age of 65 who consumed at least one caffeinated beverage. This trend is consistent with previous reports in the literature. The first two columns are a repeat of the last table showing sample size and percent consumers. The remainder of the table shows the mean daily intake expressed as both milligrams per, kilo, per day and milligrams per kilograms of body weight, along with the 90th percentile. The estimated mean daily caffeine intake from all caffeinated, caffeinated beverages is 165 milligrams. Intake steadily increased with increasing age up to age 65 and older, where it falls slightly. And for the most part, these trends are similar for the 90th percentile data. The 50 to 64-year-old group has the highest intakes. These data also follow a similar pattern to that reported from the previous beverage survey analysis nearly a decade ago, but are higher. I would also like to point out out that we did not look at caffeine intake, that we did look at caffeine intakes by gender in adults, and there were some differences between men and women for average daily caffeine intakes. However, there were no differences after adjusting for body weight. This table shows the mean caffeine intake for total beverages which is the same as the previous table, as well as the mean for each beverage category. And again, these data are for all caffeinated beverage consumers, such that the total caffeine intake in the first column is equal to the sum of coffee, carbonated soft drink, tea, and energy drinks. <coughs> for all ages combined, the sum of these four beverage categories alone contributed nearly all of the caffeine. The data also answers the question, what beverage type is contributing proportionately more to total caffeine intake? The answer is clearly coffee, certainly for all ages combined and for adults, but less so for children, where intakes are distri distributed fairly equally across coffee, carbonated soft drinks, and tea. Also notable are how little energy drinks are contributing to beverage caffeine intakes. As mentioned previously, we did not include chocolate-containing beverages in the table since the contribution to total caffeine was very small, even though about 14% of the population reported consuming them. In the case of energy shots, the proportion of the consumers in the sample was too low to estimate <coughs> even when combining all ages. These two categories together contributed less than 1 to 4% to total caffeine depending on the age group and the amount of caffeine from these two categories are included in the estimates of total caffeinated beverages. This table illustrates the importance of examining users only to understand more clearly what is driving caffeine intake. For each category, the mean 90th percentile and the percentage of users are presented. For example, 55% of all caffeinated beverage consumers consume coffee, 63% carbonated soft drinks, 53% tea, and 4% consume energy drinks. Within the 50 to 64 year old age group category, 71% consume coffee, and when they consume coffee, their estimated intake on average is 223 milligrams, or 462 milligrams at the 90th percentile. 
This table also shows where sample size was too low to obtain reliable estimates. These include the youngest children for coffee and for several age groups within the energy drink category. In summary, caffeine intakes in the U.S. comes primarily from four beverage types. Total coffee, including decaffeinated types, total tea, carbonated soft drinks, and energy drinks. Of those consuming caffeinated beverages, more than half consume carbonated soft drinks, coffee, and tea, which reflects a significant number of caffeine-consuming respondents who consume more than one type of beverage. While consumption of chocolate-containing beverages is higher, the, ca the caffeine content is very low, and thus little caffeine is contributed to total intake. Energy drinks and shots contribute little to beverage intakes, beverage caffeine intakes. Mean daily caffeine intake is 160, was 165 milligrams. These intakes are higher than in previously reported 1990, and then in the previously reported 1999 beverage survey, where caffeine intake from beverages was 120 milligrams per day. This dif difference represents or is equivalent to about a half a cup of coffee or a can of carbonated soft drink. There could be several explanations for this. First, there was slightly more caffeine cons occasions reported, although we don't show that data. 1.8 in this survey versus 1.5 in the previous one. There was also a slight increase in the amount of coffee consumed by one fluid ounce and a decrease in carbonated soft drinks, which has less caffeine. The shift is consistent with some recent reports of trends in consumption of sugar sweetened beverage, in, beverages. In addition, the database values used for the study reflect higher caffeine values for specialty brand coffee, which may have also contributed. A notable finding was the low consumption of energy drinks. These were relatively new to the marketplace in 1999 and not estimated in our previous work. Even though some energy drinks contain levels of caffeine similar to coffee, consumption in this survey contributed little to caffeine intakes. Overall, caffeine intakes, excuse me, contributed little to overall caffeine intakes in this survey. Overall caffeine intakes in children 2 to 12 are higher and the coffee intakes in particular are inconsistent with previous studies where there is little coffee consumption among children. However, in our earlier work, we did not look at users within a specific beverage category, so we did not have an estimate of caffeine from just the coffee drinkers. And lastly, and to keep this in perspective, coffee consumption in these youngest age groups of children is less than 1% of all caffeinated beverage consumers and only 9% of all children between the age of 2 and 12. The 90th percentile for caffeine for all caffeinated beverages is 380 milligrams per, per day or 5 milligrams per kilogram per day, the majority of which is coming from coffee. While there are no official recommendations for caffeine in the U.S., the Health Canada recommendations for caffeine are often used as the reference values. In addition, the FDA released two letters in 2012, and the first one, it stated that 400 milligrams per day was not associated with adverse health effects, and a second stay, saying the value reflects the recommendations set forth by Health Canada. For adults over the age of 35, this level is slightly above these recommendations, and for women of childbearing age, these levels fall below 300 milligrams per day, which is the recommended level for pregnancy. For younger children less than 12 years of age and older children aged 13 to 17 years, intakes at the 90th percentile were above the recommendation. However, for young adults 18 to 34 years of age, intakes at the 90th percentile were well below the recommendations that is, below 400 milligrams or 5 milligrams per kilogram. To conclude, this is the first population-based study, to our knowledge, estimating caffeine intakes from beverages in the U.S. in over a decade. Caffeine intakes remain largely driven by coffee consumption and, to a lesser extent, tea and carbonated soft drinks. Energy drink intakes contribute very little. 
The increase in accuracy afforded by the caffeine database developed for this study was a major strength, although, although this may have contributed to slightly higher than previous, slightly higher caffeine intakes than previously reported. However, these data do little to support the notion that the introduction of additional caffeinated beverages in the marketplace has resulted in proportionately higher caffeine intakes by various subpopulations of consumers. Thank you, and I look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you, Diane. We're going to hold the questions and hear both speakers um, so that we can handle the discussion uh, perhaps more efficiently. Our next speaker is Dr. Victor Fulgoni. He's the Senior Vice President of Nutrition Impact, a consulting firm um, that helps food companies develop and communicate science-based claims. Um, and he's done a lot of work over the years um, working with a variety of different databases on food consumption and um, components of that food. 